Let's go back to This Is Wonderland. Sure. Where did those characters come from? Well, you spent, we spent two and a half years in court. You know, we did a lot of research. But for just that reason, we wanted to see what was really going on. We wanted our law straight. We wanted to see what was happening. And they're just there. I kept saying to people. Uh, but other writers don't pick up those characters. It's like in Suburban Motel. Well, maybe they don't it's care. In Beyond Mozambique. Yeah, yeah. Where do these characters in your... In well, they're the ones... Where do they come from? They just talk to me. They're the ones that talk to me. I, I would go into mental health court, for example, and, and we were doing Wonderland, and I was, the, the, I would, could only last in there for about an hour in each time, you know, it's, it's devastating. Because they would hear things, and people normally me think that's because I have certain issues myself, you know, so I, they would be talking and I'd hear them, and I'd hear them on so, in such a way that I just, that's all I wanted to do, I just wanted to put their story out there, and I find it all, I don't find it just, you know, does what Denny's about. I find it so sad, I find it funny, I find it everything. It's just so alive, the, the pain, you know, of the, of the, mental, of the mentally ill. So that, and, the, and the, the marginalized, you know, that's who I talk about. So to start, even when I write about people who are not from the working class or the underclass, or whatever you call it, I, I will tend to write about people at their wor in their worst moments. So I guess maybe that's, I, I don't know, my idea of drama is so primitive. In my dear family, someone says, I'm going to the store, and someone else says, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, that's it for me. That's all I need. I just, there's some... But from the very beginning, I mean, the first play I ever saw of yours was not by own Beyond Mozambique, but the Strazzi. Yeah. And it was people and characters and situations outside of anything that was established in the theater, at least in this yeah, yeah, country. Yeah. And I thought, where does this well, exactly. writer, where is he pulling this stuff? Well, from I don't know where I came from. I mean, from. where does that come from? I don't know. I don't know. I They're outsiders, that. though. They're always outsiders. Yeah. Yeah, me, you know, the writer, I don't know. I, but that feeling, I remember watch, sitting in with Martin Kench watching that first uh, uh, kind of dress run-through of the Strati thinking, and we both looked at each other and said, where does this fit in? Where is it, literally, where does it come from and why is it on stage? We had a lot of naturalistic theater at that time, you know, the realistic stuff, and then this. Oh, I don't know. But the stuff after, where all that stuff, a lot of the East End plays, uh Motel, that came from, like, where well, I was brought up. You know, East End, working class, blue collar. Uh, so, would you say that to young writers? You write your experience. You write. No, I wouldn't say them? anything to them except write what you need to write. If you need to write and speculate about other people, do that. Just you know, uh, I I'm so I just try and uh, if I was teaching writing, which I wouldn't, I would just encourage them to just do what they needed to do. You know, just do what you mean need. Anything, George. Yeah, just do what you need to do to start with. Just do what you think you need to do. You know, and 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 find out where where your voice is and what you by doing it, you find out where you where you, what you care about and where you go to. And when I walked into the old city hall in those courtrooms, I thought I was like, uh, I could still be there. You know, I mean, I could just go and go and go. Except I, I just I knew all those people in some way. And we weren't just writing about the criminals; we were writing about their families and everything else, and just know them. And I just wrote, um, I think all of the characters are somehow related too, you know, it's like, they're like cousins or, or people related, they're different, but they, they're related in some way, you know, they, uh, so it's an endless group of people. I just wrote a... I must say that, I mean, when I see your plays, they all characters are always from a world of cohesis. Uh, when I see some other writers, I know there's a character pick from here and a character pick from there, and oh yes, they're part of a family, but when I see a Walker piece, they are all a family, so to speak. They, there's a common denominator that's somehow shared, and I go, "What do you? Is this because they're all small versions of George?" Well, maybe. No, I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't like. I think what I it is is that again happens really quickly for me, is that I try and I, I I start early on in the writing process to just write their write what they're saying. I start hearing them really really early on, you know, and and I'm basically just going. I'm just. That's because I can write really fast because it's not really me, <laughs> it's just them. I put the situation and then, I actually, I've told this to a few people, I don't know, I don't have any remember, any memory exa exactly of actually writing Problem Child, one of the plays, and I don't have any memory of it. It was just sort of there all of a sudden. You know, I knew I wrote it, you know, but it's true, I don't really have any, I have a memory of writing the other five, it's in the Vancouver Public Library. I don't even remember where I was when I wrote Problem Child. It's the only one I didn't write. Vancouver Public Library, that's where you wrote? I wrote all the other five there. I wrote them. And you wrote them longhand or? Longhand, didn't Longhand. Just sitting there. But I don't even remember where I was when I wrote Problem Child. And I don't have any memory of writing it. I just, uh, but those characters in Problem Child in particular, all of them, have been with me for a long, long time. Okay. 
and a long time in there and versions of them and and those people in particular have been in there coming up and down in, into your consciousness receding and thinking about them and seeing them and um, so I don't know what happened when I said I don't want it to make it sound precious or even important I just truly don't have any memory of it so I was just sitting there kind of in a I don't know it just was kind of, it just came out and I didn't change anything you know, uh, I think uh, going to rehearsal made a change a few lines, you know, and actors that I didn't, you know, that normal stuff, but nothing. And uh, so that was so kind of So this jives with what you say, that the characters then will tell you what the story is. Totally, absolutely. There's not they the story that tells you what the characters Absolutely. Are. Where are you going? I do not know, but if you, if you say to yourself, sometimes that you get writer's block, I know, I said, no, but if I ever stop on something, I always say, what would she do? Right. You know, what would he do? What does he blocks saying? you? No, totally, absolutely. That just lets me go then. You know, as soon as I say what, what, if, if I'm stopped at a moment and I'm not sure, it means I've lost touch, I've lost the voice, you know, of the character. And so then I have to say a technical thing, what would she do? Right. And that frees me up again, because I see it. Well, there's only one thing she would do. And then you, you follow the thing. But if you, if you lose, and the same with the TV, if, you, if you're doing too much work, I mean, if you're holding on to it, if you're doing the writer thing, controlling it, pushing it here and there, you're not... It's not the same thing. It, for writing for me, it's just a great, exciting thing because I don't know where it's going. And there are all these people in my head talking, not like, you know, like I'm going to need medication. I might, <laughs> but not at that moment. And that's actually it's exciting. So I'm just telling their story, you know. So when things happen, I am go, wow, you know, look what happens now and this stuff. So uh, that sort of fits with the funniest moment in Canadian theater ever in my life, and I laughed till I pissed myself, well I did piss myself, but almost, it was Suburban Motel, it was Jamie Kidney, it was the end of one show, I can't even remember which one. He's in the bathroom, it it's Criminal Genius. He's in the genius. bathroom, it's, it's which? Criminal Genius. Criminal Genius. They're all dead on stage. They're dead on stage, and, he's and the, the voice, and Jamie isn't even seen, he's no. a voice from the bathroom, yeah. talking, and I was dying laughing. <laughs> well he's blaming everyone for his problem, right? <laughs> not knowing that they're all dead. And, it, and he was saying, I blame my family, I blame my siblings, I blame every teacher I've ever had. And they're all a bunch of scuffs. <laughs> and then he gets killed. That was a funny moment for me, too. Uh, oh, there's an interesting story about that. Like, uh, the first three suburban motel plays all ended on a monologue of some kind. The, Denise had her speech about, to the audience, and Jimmy had that one, and then the cop. And, had, and I never, in rehearsing, and never, and, and the plays never rehearsed the monologues. Right? I just never did it. I thought, well... We'll get to it eventually, but they all end with a monologue, so the actor, and I, I didn't I didn't really have a theory about why I was doing it, I just didn't do it. And then eventually the actor started saying, God, George, can we do the, can we do the monologue here at the end? And I go, uh, yeah, sure, sometime, we'll do that, don't worry about it. And, and somehow I just held off long enough, so when they did it, all three of them did it. And then with Jamie, it was even worse, because they said, because he wasn't going to be seen, I said, well, you can just pin it up in the bathroom, you can read it. He said, George! I'm a professional. <laughs> I've already learned the monologue. Just let me do it sometime, you know? I said, yeah, well, we'll do it. We'll get to it. And, and so when we did get to it, it was like well into the rehearsal. And just before tech, and they all nailed it. Every single one of them. They, and I realized afterwards, after I'd done this thing accidentally, they'd lived through the play. Right. So when they came to do this big thing at the end about them living through the play, it was nothing. Right. It was so easy for them. They just did it. You know, and I had no notes to give them. I had very few notes anyway, but, you know, but I had none for that. I said, oh, that's interesting. Don't let them do it. <laughs> just let them live through the play, and whatever happens at the end will be, even if it's not a monologue, if it's just a couple of moments, will be really true. And, and that was interesting. That Jamie thinks about that. That's the whole other thing for me, because I was watching uh, the first preview up in the, in, in, in the balcony of the theater. So you got all these dead people, on the stage, and an actor talking in the bathroom, they can't be seen. And the audience, not knowing where to look. Because they're looking, they realize they're looking at the dead people, and they're not doing anything, they're just being dead. And eventually they realize they don't have to do that anymore, and they start looking at each other. They're on the audience, and they're, they're laughing like that, but they're laughing with each other. It completely changed the whole dynamic of theater, right? They were just in their living room and laughing at this. And another one, a friend said to me, he says, I said, the reason people were laughing really, really hard is because they knew it was your play, and this guy was talking, and there was a good chance he was never going to stop. 
you know, that they could be there for hours, <laughs> just the not knowing, you know. Right? Because it's really, a George Walker play. <laughs> we could be here for a while. We could be here for a while. God knows what he's going to say next, you know. And it was just someone complaining about blaming everyone for his life. But that's, again, that's part of the dynamic that a, a lot of us find so exhilarating about what you write, is that it's not a plot that goes like that. It's a plot that goes like, goes that. like that, and you're always sort of caught by surprise and putting on your seatbelt because, you know, Kristen Thompson is roaring you off in another direction. Excellent. You know, and I didn't know when I was writing. The big thing is that I didn't know. And I didn't know about that moment with Jamie Kennedy in the bathroom and still, you know, I first saw it in front of an audience at that time. What do you mean? You didn't know it was going to work or you didn't... I didn't know what it was. It's me. It was just a guy in the, who wound up in the bathroom, <laughs> not knowing, and then he talked about his life and what was on his life. But George, there must be some theatrical instinct in you from all the experience you've written. I think there's a little... Knowing that this kind of structure will work in a way. There's a little, I call it the little hard voice in the middle, right? It's about time and space, right? There's a little... It's not the big voice, it's not the voice that's doing this stuff, but there's a little thing which is from experience about how much time and space and, and, and a little bit about structure that you need to do. And it's the voice that kind of guides that other voice that's just going. It's like the jazz writer, that's the big voice going. This is basically, it's like I'm just scoring a jazz ensemble and they're doing this and there's one little voice in there going, okay, but then we have to... And you're talking about time and space in the theater, in this case, yeah, in the factory time space theater, the theater. And I have so many hours before the audience all run away. Yeah, and this I've and that, and and it's, it and it's this takes <clears> up so much time. This takes up, and there's so much room, and and, and this is there, there's a narrative in here and all that of some kind. Um, okay, that's uh, yeah, but that's the small voice. I know it's there. The but hard it's, voice. You call the it hard, hard voice. voice. Yeah, it's the harder, more critical voice. That's what I mean. This right. something down there. But the voice that's writing it, doing most of the work, is that other one. It's listening to the characters going. Blah 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 blah. Right, you know, right. whatever. You know, and so and, and so when they take off like that, I think of you know, and they have these speeches and they're like they're areas to me. They're like jazz solos. You know, so I say to actors, uh, when you rehearse these plays, I think you should bring the instrument. <laughs> I mean, don't leave the saxophone at home because when you know you say, well, I'm not ready to do this, and you know, when you do it, you better be ready to play because there's the rest of the band there waiting for you to kind of pick up that stuff. So. That's the voice that writes, it, you know, the part of me that writes that has a good time writing. It's not worried, because I guess because I know the hard voice inside is helping.